by the end of chapter 3 of Romans. And uh, in chapter 27, Paul asks a question. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay. But by the law of faith. You know, if, if, God, if, if God is saving by faith in Christ and not by merit, your works, all those things you do, you have nothing to boast in. Where's your boasting? That's what Paul's saying. You think you can work for your salvation? You think you could be so good? What have you had to boast in? Think about that. That's, that's a, what do we have to boast about? What is it that you and I have and the old southern vernacular to crow about? Oh, some people are just, I am so, you know, you know, there's a lot of people like that. We can't even boast about the fact that we're fundamental in doctrine. We should be fundamental. Well, that's nothing to boast about. We have nothing at all to glory in today. So that's why Paul asked, where is boasting then? Remember, there was a, oh, we have the law. We're Israel. We're the chosen people. But you know, he's going to show us in the next chapter that they're saved the same way we are, by faith. It's reckoned to them for righteousness. And you know, he answers the question that he raises. Where's your boasting then? It's excluded. You know, by what? By what law? Of works, nay. By the works. By, by the law of faith. The word law in this first instance isn't restricted to the Old Testament law, not the Mosaic system, but means the principle of law, any law, anything that you can think of that you could do. All of you, you know, so many people have attempted legalism. People love to draw legalism into the church. You can't do this, you can't do that, you have to do this, and they boast in that. You know, a lot of people call that fundamentalism because I'm Legalism is not fundamentalism. Legalism, when you draw that into the church, just means you're not rightly dividing the word. You know, we're in the dispensation of grace, not law. So we don't need to boast in something that has no merit for salvation. Now, the second reference to law excludes the Old Testament law. It simply means a rule or principle of faith. In other words, God has the human race not on a merit system, but on the basis of simply believing what He has done for us. We're the ones that use the merit system. Oh, but we love the charts and we love the systems to say how good we are and how bad that fellow is. And uh, well, he did this, I did that. My, I'm up here, he's down here. You know, God doesn't do that. You know, if He did, we would all be in trouble. So when you look at it that way, boasting is excluded. There's nothing for us to boast about, to brag about, to crow about, nothing. And so here's that important word in verse 28, therefore. Now when you see that word, that means it's something he's been explaining before. He's going to highlight right here. There's nothing to boast about. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without deeds of the law. This is a conclusion that Paul has come to. It's not a conclusion that he's coming to because he's, you know, or even summing up what he said. It's the conclusion. Therefore, a man is justified by faith. He's given an expl explanation why boasting is excluded. Why you don't have, you can't boast. Why is boasting excluded? Man is justified by faith. Nothing that you do. And so many people are still hung up in that today, that I have to be this, I have to be that. Now Paul is going to drive the nail in right here, and this kind of clinches it. Listen to him in, in verse 29. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. In other words, God... Does, belong to the, does he belong to the Jews alone and not also to the Gentiles? Is he exclusively here or is he exclusively there? Yes, he's with the Gentiles too. He is the God of the Gentiles. You know, we're all one family when you get down to it. Now you can follow Israel back to Abraham. 
And you can stop there and say, well, that's our family. But you know, you really can't, can you? You have to go back to Noah. You have to go back to Adam. We're one family. We used to laugh because our sister Rose, gone on to heaven now, piano player, no matter who, she, who you mentioned, she could figure out how that was her fourth cousin. But you know, we're all cousins, and, you know. If you, we might be way out there, 65 times removed, but we're all one family. So he says, listen to this. This is a very forceful argument. What Paul is saying here is justification is by the law, then God does belong to the Jews only. But if justification is by faith, then he is the God of both the Jews and the Gentiles. He's, it's one God. Now, that's, there's logic there, isn't it? If a Jew persisted in this position, there must be two gods. If he's, just, he's the God of Israel only, then there has to be two gods. But that's ridiculous. They say one for the Jews, one for the Gentiles. You know, some people teach that. There's some people who, who think that there's two houses of the church, that sort of thing. But eh, the Jew would not allow that. That we talk about two gods, he's not going to allow that. He's monotheistic, as we are. He believed in one God. But see, they had a problem too. I'm going to go to rabbit trail here for a minute. They believed in one God, and then as they moved along, the influence of the Canaanites around them, and then of course Solomon bringing in all his wives and concubines and their gods, it was easy for them to start into idol worship. And because of that, and then the Babylonian captivity, then you could convince them anymore it's one God. So it's ridiculous for them to think one God for, the, for them and one God for the Gentiles. I guess probably the greatest statement that was ever given to the nation of Israel is Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. It's interesting there because the way that's written, it doesn't just say the Lord is one. The, the word actually means like a bunch of grapes. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Which can, opens the door for what? The Trinity. But there's one God, even though He exists in three separate persons, there's one God. And that's a loud and clear message He gave in the pagan world before Christ came. There is one God. I don't care how many idols you have sitting on your wall, there, on your wall, on your counter, in your windows, or in your temple, there's only one God. Now, all those nations were polytheistic. The Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, they were all polytheistic, many gods. They had a God for the sun, had a God for the moon, they had a God for crops, had a God for this, had a God for that. There's only one God. So in verse 30, he says, seeing it is one God, which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. <clears throat> Again, only one God. It's emphatic here. He's making a statement, seeing it is one God. In the Old Testament, he gave Israel the law. Man failed. In every dispensation, man failed. In innocence, he failed. They ate the fruit of the tree. In human conscience, knowing right from wrong, they failed. God could only find one righteous man. In human government, they failed. They were supposed to go, go through all the world and repopulate it. They went down to the plains of Shinar, there outside of Babylon, and built towers. And under the law, the promise came. And then the law came, and man couldn't keep that. They failed, and now we're under grace. But God did not save them by keeping the law. Salvation has always been by the sacrifice which man brought in faith. And it all pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. That sacrifice by faith. And I'm going to tell you right now, the people who brought that sacrifice out of obligation, that's not faith. It's not. And they're not, that, that's not saving faith there. That's obedience. That's how I'm just going to follow the law. That's not what would, and it has to be faith. It has to come from here. 
Many Christians today, or many people I should say, who think they're Christians, they're just following the book. It's not in here. It's not the faith. God saves by faith, not by working. Again, what do you got to boast about? Well, I'm a fundamental Christian. I do this, I do that. Do you believe in Christ? Well, I, I, I read about it. Do you believe it's the faith that saves? And 31, he says, verse 31, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. The law, the reference to law here, I think, brings in another meaning of this word. It's not restricted completely to the Mosaic system, and nor does it refer to just any law. It refers to the entire Old Testament canon, the Old Testament revelation. Because that old, the Old Testament points to the new, points to Jesus Christ. It points to the coming of the Messiah. We're told all the way in Genesis, the seed of the woman, and it points there. Does this make faith, does it make the Old Testament Scriptures void? No, it doesn't. That's what God forbid. Because it's the schoolmaster we know. The schoolmaster to bring us to a knowledge of Christ. And it's not taught enough today. The Old Testament is kind of pushed aside in many places. But in the old, the new is concealed. In the new, the old is revealed. You need all 66 books. And even though we're not under the Mosaic law, we still need the Old Testament because it points to the truth. Not only to the coming of Jesus Christ, not only to His sacrifice at the cross, but it also takes us to the kingdom. Doesn't mention the church, but it's still, it were pointed forward. And when you take what it tells us there and what we know in the New Testament, we build upon that. Faith excluded the works of the law. There it is. The works of the law, are just they don't do it. But did it revoke the entire Old Testament revelation? Of course not. God's word is forever settled in heaven. And I know people have trouble with this. Well, look at what it says here. This is a, well... You have to remember the law was given to who? Israel. And what, what's given in the New Testament? For example, Ten Commandments. Nine of them are given to us in the New Testament as directives, with the exception of remember the Sabbath. And everything we're given in the New Testament is a higher standard. You know, Paul's going to demonstrate in the next chapter with the Old Testament illustrate by the illustration of two men, of course, David and Abraham. But... Uh, even that didn't exclude them. They had to come by faith, not by the works of the law. And these two key men, they're outstanding men, were saved. And again, not by the law, because the law saved no one, but by faith. To begin with, let's think about Abraham. Abraham was born, he lived, and he died 400 years before the law was even given. Abraham did not live on the basis of the Mosaic law. It was not given in his day. God saved him on a different basis, which is by faith. Now somebody's going to say, well, David lived under the law. I've heard all these arguments too. David lived under the law. Well, honestly, do you think that uh, David was saved by keeping the law? Of course he wasn't. Let's look, just look at the life of David. He committed adultery. He committed murder. False witness. Hmm. That's just to name a few of them. But yet he said he's a man after God's own heart. So he couldn't keep the law. Hmm. But God saved him. How? How did God save him? He saved him by faith. David, David's a perfect example of us. He's a sinner saved by grace. David trusted God. He believed God. Even in his sin... He came and what did he do? He confessed his sin to God. God accepted him and he saved him by faith. Of course, he's being saved on credit. Let me tell you that right now. The Old Testament saints were saved by credit. They're looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, his sacrifice. When Jesus died on the cross, he led captivity captive. They were free then to go. Today, when you and I take the position that we're sinners, we come to God and trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, regardless of who we are, where we are, how we are, or when we are, God will save you. 
For God today has put man on the basis, on one basis, and one basis alone, faith. The question is, this is what God asks the world today. If everyone could open their ears and hear God speak, He would say, what will you do with my son who died for you on the cross? That's what He's going to ask. That's the question. You have, that's the only question that had with eternal consequences, by the way. So as we get to this great section of Revelation, sorry, Romans, it's a great section of justification by faith. We've seen the doctrine. Paul has vividly stated with no exclusions that man is a sinner. Go back to chapter 1, you see man is a sinner. We're, people say, low down rotten skunk and you better apologize to the skunk because we're, we're, we're stinkier than he is. So he, then he revealed that God provides righteousness for sinners and justification by faith has been explained. Now it's going to illustrate the truth of these two men. He picks two out of the Old Testament. And he does this with purpose. Why would he pick Abraham and David? I guess because in, David, in Paul's day, there were no two greater men recognized by Israel than Abraham and David. Abraham is the founder of the people of the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people. He's the founder. David is their greatest king. And it be the throne of David. So Paul uses these Old Testament heroes, if you will, as illustrations to establish the statements he's made back in chapter 3. And there's, there's, there's harmony and agreement between the law and the gospel now. Although they represent two completely opposed system neither contradicts nor conflicts the, with the other god's word doesn't do that you just have to rightly divide it and you will understand but they are not mutually exclusive even under the law before the law faith was god's total requirement for salvation i don't care where you go back in time what dispensation man is always saved by faith doesn't matter now, I know that you know, we're dispensationalists. There are covenant theologians which dominate today. That's the primary, when you get away from really biblical people, they go to the covenant theologian. Works and grace, that's all they say. But yet it doesn't harmonize with Scripture because you can't be saved by works. So Paul's not presenting when he's talking about justification by faith. and he, He's not presenting some new strange doctrine which cancels out the Old Testament and leaves the Jew afloat in the sea on a sinking ship holding a boat anchor for a light fest. That's not what he's doing here. Paul's showing that Abraham and, and David are in the same lifeboat. Talking about sinking here, with, which he, he's offering his people today. God has a lifeboat for everyone, Jew or Gentile. doesn't matter. And that lifeboat is titled Justification by Faith. Every, every ship has a name. That's this one. The law was an educator. A schoolmaster, as we say. And it took man that was under the law, took him by the hand, and led him to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we see in the first five verses, that's right, I'm finally going to get to chapter 4 now. In the first five verses, that Abraham was justified by faith. Verse 1 says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? Let's rearrange the modifiers here a little bit to help us follow Paul's thought. Now you have to remember, it's a little difficult when you translate Greek into into English. You know, in English it's noun, verb, participle. Well, in Greek it's participle, verb, noun. It's completely reversed. And it's easy to get your modifiers where it's hard for us to understand. Therefore, what shall we say that Abraham, our first father, has found according to the flesh, that is, by natural human effort? That's a free translation of that verse. The therefore or the what? 
See, it's basically the same thing here. Therefore, because he's connecting things together. That opens the door to this new chapter and it connects all of the arguments that Paul's already talked about back in chapter 3. The gospel excludes boasting, establishes the law as we've seen, and Abraham and David confirm Paul in this thesis. And what he's saying, these two men confirm what he's talking about. Paul used the, the phrase that he uses so often, what shall we say? Again, so many questions in Scripture. Why? Because it makes us think, or it should. Some people just say, well, tell me the answer. We'll start to think about it. And that's what Paul wanted his readers to think about it. And he uses it here and, and other places when he's trying to present arguments, he asks this question, what shall we say? In the first division, Paul didn't attempt to prove or argue that man's a sinner. He didn't need to, really. Uh, for this reason, we'd not find it there. Man knows he's a sinner. I don't care what he says. He knows he's a sinner. Also, in the last section of the epistle, which is practical, he doesn't admit this question at all. Now, Abraham, our father, our first father, if you can't think about it that way, but with a Jewish mindset, reveals that the nation of Israel began with Abraham. Our father, that's a particular expression when you add the first there to really make it a definite. Our father. Now, when we think father, we think differently, don't we? We think about God, the father. But this reveals the importance of Abraham who was chronologically the first. The first of the nation. Now, <clears throat> J. Vernon McGee said that when he was a pastor in Nashville, several friends he had known before he studied for the ministry uh, were Jewish friends. And they invited him to come out one evening to speak to the Young Men's Hebrew Association. So he said he spoke on the glories of the Mosaic Law. Good choice. And uh, he was amazed to find that they reckoned their ancestry from Adam, from, from Abraham. They never went past Abraham going that direction. That's the founder of our nation. We don't go back any farther. He said that he asked a few questions. He said, don't you count Noah or Adam in that line? And a young Jewish friend said that he laughed and said, no, we stop at Abraham. He is our first father. So you see, Paul has the same experience here. He understands the Jewish mindset. He's Jewish. Abraham is where they begin. And that's, that's why he says, our father. And in their mind, our first father, our founding father. You know, we say our founding father, who do we think? George Washington. But see, you're thinking nationally here, you need to be thinking spiritual. But we get tied up in these things. We get tied up in earthly things rather than the things of the Bible. And it's pertaining to the flesh. Uh, this could modify Abraham or it could modify the verb has found. What, what has he found according to the flesh? Abraham has found that uh, works according to the flesh didn't produce boasting. It produced shame and confusion. Abraham's works, many of them, that's what happened. You know, again, the Bible shows us Abraham as Abraham was a man. You know, we think how, how, what a great Old Testament saint. And he was. But he was just like us. She's not my sister. She's my wife. Well, that's a half truth. Well, a half truth is a full lie. Did it twice. He was a weak man at times because his faith was down here. But yet, in his, his latter years, when his faith had built and he had trusted God, he was willing to sacrifice his own son knowing that God was not going to prevent that line from continuing. So, that was Abraham's works. He had nothing to boast of. Don't misunderstand me. I think Abraham was a great man especially in the, in the matter of Lot, for example. He was. You choose. Lot took the best. He went the other way. And then the 
when the kings and the cities were captured, he went out there and you know, he would brought them back. He wouldn't let the king of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah reward him for that. In another section, Abraham didn't believe God. He ran down to Egypt. And this matter of the little Egyptian maid that he got while he was there and the son that came from her, the problem still exists today. He was weak at times. But I want you to notice how Paul is going to develop this idea in verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. If Abraham was justified, that is, if he was declared righteous, and we know that's a very repeated verse in Scripture we'll get to. Abraham believed and was reckoned to him for righteousness. If he were justified, declared righteous by works, works of the flesh, he hath wherefore whereof to, to glory, but not before God. Oh, you can boast before man, and we do it wonderfully, don't we? But you can't stand before God and boast. You can glory in self, but you cannot glory before God. So many times we try to steal God's glory. God does it. We want to take credit for it. You know, it's assumed that Abraham had good works that counted before God. And I pray that we do too, that we have good works for Him. Now, we talk about good works. I don't care what you're doing. If you're not doing it for him, it's not good work. Well, I gave money to help that orphan over there. Did you do it for you or did you do it for the Lord? If you did it for you, that's not a good work. Man thinks it's a good work. Well, look how generous he is. But you can't say anything to the Lord about it, can you? But if you gave because it's the, you love the Lord and he put it on your heart and you never say a word about it, that's something you can, that's glory in God. You're giving Him the credit. That's why, you know, things, I see things done, things that no one ever mentions it because they're doing it for the Lord. He did do many good things. But the startling thing was to discover that these good works were not the grounds for His salvation, but were the result of His salvation the result of him being justified by faith. That's when our works really begin. Once we're saved, once we come to Jesus Christ and he changes our life and we begin to work for him, then you have good works. It's that simple. You're already saved. Not faith, not works for, for salvation, but faith that works because you're saved. It's what James tries to teach and people misunderstand. So you see, James and Paul did not contradict each other when James said, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar in James 2.21? The works that James describes are not the works of the flesh, under the law, because Abraham wasn't under the law, they were works of faith. When he took his son and he, he bound him and he laid him on that altar and he took that knife and he's ready to plunge it in, that is a work of faith. He wasn't working for salvation. James is making that clear. Abraham believed God and he offered up Isaac. But did he actually do it? No, God stopped him and would not let him go through with it. Why? Because it was wrong. To take his son's life was wrong. God was just seeing proof. He wanted proof of the faith that Abraham had. You see, Paul and James quote the same verse. Abraham believed and he counted it unto him for righteousness. But James goes to the end of Abraham's life to the time when he offered up Isaac. Abraham stood on the same ground on which the very weakest sinner will stand. Granted, you know, that he did have works in which to boast, but he could never boast before God because God does not accept the works of the flesh. And if you read of the life of Abraham, you never see him getting on a soapbox and telling God what a good person he is and what about his works, does he? 
So the works of the flesh cannot stand before God's holiness. And certainly Abraham's works were, you know, wonderful, but they could not stand before a holy God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed and it was counted unto him for righteousness. You know, I think to me, that's one of the most repeated verses. People know this verse. You know, the number one verse people memorize, don't you? Jesus wept. That's then John 3, 16. But I think that's the first verse that we memorized when I was in, we a little bit, Jesus wept because it's easy for a kid. But see, you need to grow. Like we talked about this morning, you need to grow. You can't stay stagnant. You have to be able to remember more. Unfortunately, now I'm too old. I can't remember anything. But remember those verses. So Paul appeals to the Scripture as final authority here. You know, that's, that's the place to go, isn't it? He's trying to make the point that you can't work for your salvation. What does the Bible say? What does the Scripture say? Abraham believed, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. Well, what a powerful statement is there. He person, uh, personifies it here. The Scripture is God speaking. He could easily say, what has God said? It is God's Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was uh, came flesh and dwelt among us in verse 14. And here we say, what does Scripture say? What does Jesus say? What does God say? It's what Scripture says, and there's no higher authority to which you can appeal. When you have spiritual discussions, this, my friends, is the Supreme Court. Here it is. No commentary. Know what this fellow said. This is it. And that's where Paul goes. The Bible is the Word of God in, in such a way that whatever the Bible says, God says, according to Dr. Warfield. It's God's Word. How I wish more men who claim to be evangelical really believe the Word of God. That it is the Word of God. That it's God speaking. You know, our last pre-meal meeting, that was... The main thing we talked about, preach the Word. Teach the Word. It's God speaking. So many people have gotten away from preaching the Word. They're more involved. They, they want social time. They want entertainment. Preach the Word. You know, Paul quotes from the Old Testament directly about 60 times in Romans. He's going back to what God says. This quotation, of course, is found in Genesis 15, 6. And he believed the Lord and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So Paul is saying, here's what the Scripture says. God is speaking to you in His Word. Boy, that's tremendous, isn't it? God is... Don't take my word for it, Paul says. Listen to God. God is speaking. Listen to him. And this promise was given to Abraham at a time when he raised a question with God. What will thou give me, seeing I go childless? That's Genesis 15, 2. Oh, Lord, you, I, I'm, you tell him I'm going to be a great nation. I'm going to possess the land and I'm going to have a blessing. Where's my children? And then four verses later we see and he believed the Lord. He's believing in what God says, even though it seems unbelievable to him. And that's why a lot of people today they have problems. Well, I just can't believe a man rose from the dead. That's what faith is. Believing on what you can't see, but you know is true. You know, God gave him no assurance other than his confirmation of the promise. That his seed would be like the stars of the sky or the sands of the beach. In other words... Abraham simply believed God. You know, he's getting to be an old man. He's about 90 years old there. And I don't have a child. There's no honor, no merit in Abraham believing the faithful God who cannot lie. He doesn't, he just believes. The honor was God's. God, the Bible tells God cannot lie. So when Abraham believed God, he did one thing that man can do without doing anything. 
God made the statement. God made the promise. And God undertook to fulfill it. When you look at the Abrahamic covenant, it's wonderful. You know, God says, I will give you a seed. I will give you a blessing. I will give you the land. He doesn't say, I will if. It's literal, unconditional, and it's eternal. And it's a promise of God. That's why we know that we're going to see the kingdom. Because God promised it to Israel. They've never yet possessed the land. They will. God has said so. When they get into the kingdom, they'll have the land. Abraham believed. His faith was not something that he worked for, no effort. It was not an act. It was an attitude. That's faith. His heart was turned completely away from himself to God and to God's promise. I think I mentioned this morning, you have to always make choices. Do you choose the world? Do you choose God? Which one you love the most? Abraham loved God. He chose to follow. He chose Him. He believed Him. This left God, once Abraham believed, had faith in Him, this left God free to fulfill His promises. That was, that's the requirement, just faith. When you came to Jesus Christ as your Savior, God then became free to fulfill His promise to you of eternal life. Your sins are forgiven and remembered no more. You know, faith was neither a, mature, a, a, a merit by Abraham nor a, a change of character or nature in Abraham. He simply believed God to accomplish what He had promised. He knows that God will. God can. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Genesis 12, 3. He believed that. That's wonderful. And counted unto him for righteousness. God counted. He reckoned unto him. God put it to Abraham's account. I always like to think of it that way. That's what salvation is. Once we come to Jesus Christ for salvation, placed on our account in the sacrifice of Christ and His righteousness. And all those sins and everything that's tearing up our life are placed on Jesus. They were placed on Him at the cross. God counted and reckoned Him. He imputed it on Him for righteousness. It was not righteousness, but that it's how God reckoned it. God reckoned righteousness unto Him. So I have time to finish this section. I'm going to anyway. Verses 4 and 5. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But of him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. It's a general rule that the workman is paid wages for the service that he renders. A man works so, for so much an hour or and he's paid or paid so much for a particular job. We understand about that. Obviously, Abraham was not a workman, for he did not earn what he received. His salvation was received only on the basis that he was undeserved. It's an undeserved favor. Grace. The grace of God. He believed God. But to him that worketh not, that is... There's nothing you can do that will merit salvation. If you work for it, it's a wage. Salvation is a free gift. But you believe on Him that is God who declares the ungodly righteous. And He cannot do that any other way than by faith. The only kind of people God is saving today are unrighteous people. Now I know there's some people out there that have been saved 43 times. No, they haven't. God only saves the unrighteous. It's only takes... Now, I know people have thought they were saved. It's a common thing. Usually a young person who doesn't really understand gets caught up in the emotion. Some people have made professions four or five times where it finally hits them and they understand and, and they accept it. But God only saves the unrighteous. And somebody said... Does that mean that God won't save good people? Can you name one good person? 
No, he doesn't save good people. There's no good people out there. There's nothing good save one. That's God. God will save any man. Good or bad or indifferent. Of course, there are no good. But the Scripture says, there are none righteous. No, not one. That puts us in a, everybody in the same boat. So this is according to God's standard. Not my little standard or your little standard where we judge people. If we were God and judging people, we would just we would look at this fella and that fella and this one over here and well this one's okay, I'll take him and him will put that God doesn't do that. We're all in the same boat. You know, if uh, you want to name somebody who's good, you know what you're doing? You're calling God a liar. Because God says there are none. Are you prepared to call God a liar? I'm not. I'm sure I have many times over the years, but I'm not prepared to do it now. And of course, you would also have to prove your point, wouldn't you? If you say, well, that's a good person. Hey, prove it. Well, he might be good in man's eyes, but not in God's. Not until he comes to Jesus Christ and he's reckoned righteous. His faith is counted for righteousness. Faith is the only condition. God accepts faith in lieu of works. There's no merit in faith, but is the only way of receiving that which God freely offers. Faith honors God and it secures righteousness for man. God put down righteousness in Abraham's account to his credit. You remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man? Who did the rich man see when he looked across that great gulf fixed there in Sheol, Hades, the Old Testament? Abraham, and he recognized him. Abraham's account was right. He wasn't in heaven yet. Why wasn't he in heaven yet? Well, he believed he, he was deemed righteous. Well, the doorway to heaven had yet not yet gone to the cross. He would very soon leave captivity captive, but not at that point. It was on his account. He was saved, just waiting to go home. And faith counted for what was not. You know, he didn't have. You know, faith was. He didn't have anything on his own. Faith counted for that. That righteousness from God, and that's important for us to see. And I finished with Abraham tonight. Next week, Lord willing, we'll pick up in verse 6, talking about David.